Welcome, everyone. Well, today's a big day. We're going to go to the wastewater treatment plant, right? Yeah. All right. I hope that uh, have lunch before you go because you won't have an appetite afterwards. All right? Nah, it depends on how you look at it. If you're in the business of wastewater treatment, it's a good smell. It's very close to the university. No, no, it's, uh, it's very close to campus. Um, once we get in the cars, we'll be driving there. It'll take us 10 minutes maximum, so it's very close. We need to meet at EB2-115. That's the room. We should be there at 2 p.m. Any questions about that? I hope you have plenty of film for your cameras, right? Lots of rolls of film or your phone, yeah. Um, I think in the email, Akil said that we'd be back by, what do you say, 3.45? So we should be definitely finished by 4. That's shorter than normally your labs are three hours long, right? And when I was uh, here before, he would always make it exactly three hours. He'd take to the full 5 p.m. So today is a special treat, getting finished a little early. All right. That's what I just said. Yeah. All right, so let's look at some other announcements here. By tomorrow at 5 p.m., you should upload part two, which is focusing on the research-related aspects of your project. So you're doing research to find out what kind of new ideas are people working on, and then you're synthesizing all of that research. You're not just summarizing each paper. Here's five papers. This is what it says in each paper. That's not enough. You need to find what's the common theme between those five papers. What is it maybe that they all have in common that they're trying to achieve? Is it savings in energy economy? Is it a reduction in effluent concentration? Somehow there must be like some direction that your topic is headed in and I'd like you to analyze that. After the vacation, then uh, the air quality homework is due on Sunday. What we're going to do today is the last piece of that puzzle. We're going to be doing something called a, a Gaussian dispersion model. And it's kind of a nice way of uh, tracking how much pollution is in the air. So any questions on the announcements before we move, uh, move on to the content? So air pollution itself can go to a couple of places, ultimately. You know, what we'd really like to do is minimize the amount of air pollution. And we can minimize air pollution by uh, reducing the amount of energy we use, by minimizing uh, the amount of trips in a car. If you carpool, you're minimizing air pollution because you're putting more people in a vehicle. Um, if you change the quality of the engine to make it so it's cleaner burning and emitting less particulates, that's another way of minimizing air pollution. Or there are ways of removing air pollution before it actually gets into the air. You can put a filter in the smokestack. And you can try and um, get particulates to get stuck on a bag filter. Or there are ways of using electricity to attract small particles. That's called electrostatic precipitation. So you can do some sort of treatment that removes it before it gets into the environment. But even with minimization and removal, still there's going to be a lot of pollution that gets into the air. And so what we need are tools that will analyze and tell us what's the concentration at a certain point uh, downstream from a smokestack. And so that's what the Gaussian dispersion model does, is it looks at when you have a pollutant plume going into the air, is there a way of predicting how much the pollution is spreading out as it enters the air? And the way that the Gaussian dispersion model works is it, uh, it models uh, diffusion, which is a, uh, a transport mechanism. And uh, the way that diffusion works is just visualize what would happen if I had a canister of tear gas, and I set it in the corner of the room there, and then I opened it up. What you could imagine is that the tear gas would start spreading out. Just because of the way that um, uh, entropy works, we know that you know, things always get more disorganized, or that when there's a uh, a location of high concentration that spreads out to locations of, of low concentration. And so it would start in that corner and probably the last place in the room that would have fresh air would be the opposite corner in the room. And it would gradually start spreading out just because the molecules themselves are moving, the air molecules. 
And so it's the movement of the air molecules that would uh, randomly start to distribute that pollutant until it's evenly dispersed inside of, the, uh, inside of the room. So on the screen here, what this is illustrating is that if you had a cylinder full of any gas or liquid, so if you've got a cylinder full of a fluid, and then you release some, side of, some sort of a constituent, it could be maybe a drop of food coloring, it can be a pollutant. If you have a location of high concentration, it will spread out towards wherever the concentration is low. And this diffusion is a process that can be described with a normal distribution. I'm sure you've seen the bell curve before. Have you already taken a statistics class? Okay, you probably remembered the idea of a standard distribution is how far from the center line of a bell curve you go and either side Standard distribution would include, I think, what, 67% of the area under the curve is within plus and minus one standard distribution of a bell curve. What, what it means in a physical sense is, if I have here is the canister of tear gas and I open it up, some of that is going to spread out quickly, but the majority of the mass is going to be close to the location of origin. And the longer we wait, the wider that bell curve would get. And so the way that this works when we're talking about a pollutant plume is we think how far sideways and how far downwind is the pollutant getting from that plume. And here is an image that sort of shows two bell curves. And uh, you have to sort of think in three dimensions to really make sense of what's happening. But when we have a cross-sectional view like this, a side view, we can see that the plume is getting wider, right? It's starting to get higher up into the atmosphere and closer down to the ground. The dimension that we don't see is that it's also getting wider this way. So into the page, the plume starts as the same diameter as the smokestack, very small diameter, and it's gradually getting bigger. And we think of it as circular, even though and if there's a crosswind, it might interrupt that, but we assume that it just sort of, uh, the plume itself is moving in the direction of the wind, and then it gets wider and wider and spreads out. But it's not even concentration everywhere in that circle. In the center line, the concentration is the highest, but the concentration is decreasing the further away you get from the center line. And that's what these bell curves represent, is that in the center, concentration is high, but if you deviate laterally, here at the bottom you can see we're talking about the y direction is sideways, which is perpendicular to the wind direction. Here, the wind speed is u, and in the direction of x is what we're orienting our wind speed. So essentially, here's a picture of a smokestack, and you can see that the wind is blowing, the plume is getting wider, it's getting taller, and we want to know, at the ground level, what's the concentration of whatever this is. It may be particulates, it might be sulfur, and whatever the compound is that we're trying to keep track of, then uh, downwind, that's the, uh, the concentration that we're trying to find out. Any questions so far about what this model is trying to do? Yeah? It is. So the faster the wind is moving, think about how much that's spreading out versus how much it's staying together. If the wind is moving just very slowly, then over time the plume will be a bigger diffusion than if the wind is blowing hard, then the plume will be closer together because um, it's spreading out over time, but a heavy wind will move the smoke further away faster. And so it takes more of a distance downwind before it's really spreading out. So it is subject to wind speed. The wind not only controls the direction, but it also controls how close together the smoke is at a certain location. So there's a couple of things we have to know <coughs> to be able to use this approach, to actually come up with concentrations. Um, we have to know what the atmosphere is doing, and how stable is the atmosphere. And that's related to the uh, adiabatic lapse rate. Remember, we were talking about 
the, uh, the change in temperature being one degree Celsius for every hundred meters of elevation that we go up. And um, there's also the thermal effects that happen between day and night when uh, there can be a heat island, if there's a lot of sunshine going down on pavement, and then once the sun goes down, it begins to radiate all of that heat. For the Gaussian dispersion model, there is a, it's kind of, a, it's an empirical model, meaning that there's a lot of factors in it that are just drawn from observation. And they've classified on a letter scale how stable the environment is versus how unstable it is, and that affects how much the pollution spreads out within the plume. And they're assigning the letter A to unstable conditions and F to stable conditions. So unstable means that the pollution is spreading out more. It's, it's getting more diffuse more quickly. And so if you look at what kind of concentrate, what kind of conditions will lead to unstable conditions, first of all, there's wind speed. So each one of these rows is corresponding to measuring the wind speed at 10 meters, so 10 meters from the ground level. And if you have a low wind, that's going to have a classification of A, which is unstable, compared to high winds is more closer to the stable classification, you know, closer to F. And the reason for that is back to the idea of if the wind is blowing, how quickly is this plume going to spread out? If there's just a very gentle breeze, then it's going to be very wide by a certain location. But if the wind is blowing harder, then it's going to be more closely, tightly, tightly grouped because the pollutant is, uh, has a higher velocity as it's spreading out. You know, its rate of expanding is related to time. And so it's covered a greater distance before the pollutant plume gets to a certain location. So wind speed is one of the factors. Solar radiation is another because the higher the solar radiation, the uh, more unstable conditions are it will uh, cause the plume to spread out more if there's a lot of heat rising from the ground surface. Yeah. Um, sometimes what they'll do in a, in a chimney like this, sometimes they'll spray water. And if they spray water, then that can be a way of getting, for example, sulfur. Sulfur gases will get trapped by the water and then they would try and treat the water. So just having a, a spray of water. Sometimes they would put this smoke to go through a bag, like a vacuum bag, and that will trap particles. Um, and um, another mechanism is to have electrodes inside of there, and the electrodes would attract particles. Um, but in most cases, if, for example, you're spraying the water, you've turned an air pollutant now into polluted water. And so you're just changing the location of the pollution. There are a few things they can do to, uh, to reduce the intensity of the smoke, for sure. OK, so the two factors, again, just to summarize, this table is taking into account is the wind speed and then uh, the intensity of solar radiation. Because uh, the less sunshine there is, then the more stable the atmosphere is. But uh, lots, of, lots of sun will um, make the plume spread out more because of the rising air off of the ground surface. Your book has this figure. And uh, S sub Y is the standard deviation of what the plume looks like. So back to the idea of a uh, Gaussian dispersion, or the normal or the bell curve. Um, if here is our center line, we want to know basically standard deviation, how far from the center line is the distance. And under the curve here, this is going to be representing 67% of the total mass. And so if we have condition A, which is related to unstable conditions, you can see it's spreading out more. If we're two kilometers downwind, two kilometers downwind, and we can expect that the pollutant plume will have spread out by approximately uh, two, three, four hundred meters. That's the width of the standard deviation from the center line. 
But in condition F, which is more stable, the plume hasn't spread out as wide. And so back to that same example of two kilometers, we go up to the F curve, and it looks like the width of the plume for that condition is only 60 meters. And so from this curve, you can get a sense for how wide the plume is getting under different atmospheric conditions. And this is the horizontal dispersion, and so it's how wide the plume is getting. Conditions are a little bit more complicated for vertical dispersion. You notice that these curves are diverging. They're getting further apart. And the reason for that is that um, because of the solar radiation, for example, that can cause the smoke to rise qu much more quickly in an upward direction than it can horizontally. And so it sort of spreads out horizontally at a predictable rate, but then there's a, a nonlinear relationship between how tall the pollutant gets. And, and so you can see that A has an increasingly diffuse under the uh, unstable conditions, and F, the plume, will kind of stay together when the atmospheric conditions are very stable. So we can get these values. We're going to need to know S sub Y and S sub Z for this big formula I'm about to show you. So we can either look it up out of the table based on how far downwind our location of interest is. You know, are, we, are we interested in five kilometers downwind from the uh, smokestack, 50 kilometers downwind from the smokestack, etc. So it's a, a function of the location and atmospheric classification for both the vertical and the uh, horizontal. So we can either use the figures or here is an empirical relationship that those figures are drawn from. So you can just use a formula to estimate what is the uh, standard deviation in the horizontal and vertical direction using these lookup factors. You see A, C, D, F. All of that is based on the um, is based on stability class. All right. Here's the equation that we use to calculate how much higher the smoke goes uh, before it starts to go sideways. Let me go back to this picture of the, uh, the real-life smokestack. So you'll notice that the smoke went a little bit higher, but then it kind of stops. It doesn't rise anymore after it gets to this elevation. Why do you suppose the smoke went a little bit higher? Why isn't it just spreading out at the same height as the uh, stack itself? The air density. That's right, and so it's air density because of the air temperature. The smoke that's coming out of the stack is usually warmer than the surrounding air, and so it's going to rise to a certain level, and then once it reaches the, uh, the same density as the surrounding gases, it won't rise anymore. And so what this, what this function that we're going to look at, this is the physical stack height. It's the height of the actual smokestack itself. And then the smoke rises a little bit more. And those things together, the rise and the physical stack height, will give us the effective stack height. So here's the formula for that. Um, here's the formula for the, uh, the physical stack height is H. And the, the delta H, how much higher the smoke goes, depends on the difference in the temperature between the smokestack gases, T sub S, and the surrounding air gases. And those temperatures need to be expressed in terms of Kelvin, just the way that this empirical formula is set up. You'll use Kelvin. P is the pressure in kilopascals, the atmospheric pressure. And the typical atmospheric pressure in kilopascals is 101. And then you can see it also has to do with the velocity of the smokestack gases, the diameter, the opening of the smokestack, and then the, uh, the wind velocity. So all of those things sort of come into play to say how much higher the smoke will rise up above the opening of the physical smokestack. Mm -hmm. the, the stack is the, uh, the structure. And the plume is the smoke. And so when this is saying the plume rise, that says 
the delta H is how much higher above the opening of that smokestack does the smoke rise before it sort of stabilizes and isn't going up anymore. Yeah, it's stack velocity is talking about the velocity of the, uh, of the smoke as it exits the hole in the top. Right, yeah. V sub S is the, the velocity of the smoke that's coming out. And the other velocity is the wind speed. So U is the wind speed. V is the velocity of the smoke as it's coming out of the hole. Once we know the stack height that's effective, we did all of that just to find out at what elevation does the smoke actually start spreading out. So that was to find H. H, you can see, is just one parameter in the overall Gaussian model. Um, <clears throat> e is the rate, the emission rate, for the pollutant that's coming out of the, uh, the smokestack. So it would be mass per time as the units for the emission rate. And then these two factors here, this first factor says how much the pollution concentration at your location of interest is reduced because of your location. And now here on this figure on the lower right, you can see that we're at some distance away from the center line of the smokestack. So the wind is blowing in the x direction. But where we're interested in, we're modeling some distance away perpendicular to that wind direction. And so obviously if you're in the center line of the smokestack, the concentration is highest here. But if you move sideways away from it, then the concentration is lower. And that's what this first factor takes into account, is the effect of how much the concentration went down because you're sideways away from the smoke. Then the second term here is talking about how much lower the smoke concentration is at ground level compared to up in the air at the center line of the plume. So this ratio of H, H is where the smoke is, and so you are that much further below the center line of the plume if we're interested in the concentration of ground level. So this equation is going to tell us the, uh, the concentration of any pollutant that we're interested in um, when we're downwind a certain distance and off of the center line. So any questions about how it works? All right. Everybody have a copy of today's in-class exercise? What we have for this one is a 90-meter uh, a smokestack. That's the physical height. The wind speed that's described is 5.5 meters per second. Oh, I changed something here. It's 4.0 kilometers and 500 meters from center line. That's what it says on your uh, handout, right? Let me just, I have to make a few adjustments here. I wanted to make the example slightly more interesting, so I updated your handout, but then forgot to change the slide. 11.5. All right. Now I think it's accurate. So what you're going to do is, um, First of all, calculate how much higher the gases rise, delta H. And with that, you'll be able to calculate the effective stack height. That's part A. Part B and C are to calculate the standard deviation distances, S sub Y and S sub Z, that you'll need to then turn over the page and in part D, calculate the concentration at our location of interest, which is 500 meters to the side of the center line. Okay? So here's the problem description. Remember we were talking about how sometimes carbon monoxide is because people's water heaters malfunction? I, I should have remembered that another big cause is when there's a power outage and someone is running the generator. You should put the generator outside. You shouldn't run the generator in an enclosed room. Uh, what happened in this, the news article was talking about how uh, the power was out for a certain villa, and so the landlord 
turned on a generator inside the building and then the occupants of the building, two people died because of that. The carbon monoxide concentration got so high overnight. And so uh, now the landlord and the landlord's assistant are in jail because of that. So that just sort of goes back to our lecture last time, remember, when we were talking about the, uh, the mass, uh, mass balance model for indoor air. Not to bring the mood down too low or anything here, but uh, I saw that and it made me think of our discussion. So how do you know what the stability is? It's from the description of the weather, right? It, it says that the uh, wind speed is 5.5 and uh, there's strong solar radiation because conditions are very sunny. So if we go five, between 5 and 6 meters per second, that tells us for strong incoming solar radiation, we're in stability group C. So if we're in stability group C, then um, Let's see, where was... All right, here we are. Um, X should be the distance downwind in terms of kilometers. It's so the number four is what you use for X, and then you get A, C, D, and F just from this table. And since our X is greater than one kilometer, we use the right side of that table. So you go to the row where it says C. A should be 104. C should be 61, D 9.11, and F is 0. All right, here is the uh, solution to the first part. The effective stack height should include both the physical, which is 90, so lowercase h is 90 meters, the delta H is 4.3 meters. That's how high the plume rises above the, um, above the stack. And so the sum of the two says that the, uh, the smoke center line is 94.3 meters above the ground. Okay. You can see that I've identified some of the other variables here. X is 4 because that empirical equation we're using for the standard deviations, it wants X to be in terms of kilometers. So X is 4. Here we've got our emission rate, stack diameter, exit velocity, air pressure. Everyone new to convert uh, temperature to Kelvin. Uh, We're going to use it in part D. Yeah, there's a part D on the back. All right, so did everyone get the uh, standard deviations here? 359 meters and 216. So that tells us, that gives us an idea of um, four kilometers downwind, how spread out the plume is. You have to go 359 meters away um, sideways to get the concentration that is equal to one standard deviation. And then um, vertically speaking, it's 216 meters above or below that the uh, that the standard deviation is uh, for vertically. So now in part D, you're going to use this equation to find out the PM10 concentration at the location of interest. Now location of interest means the spot that's 500 meters sideways from the center line. So four kilometers downwind, that's our X, and the Y is 500 meters. So we've already calculated S sub Y just now with that empirical formula. We know S sub Z, and the problem statement tells us our emission rate and the wind speed. So what you can do is calculate the, uh, the concentration of PM10 at the location. So the location of interest is 500 meters sideways away from the center line of the plume. Uh, you're like, why would that be a location of interest? I don't know, maybe there's a, a, a hospital or a school, you know, you're, you're trying to locate something downwind of a known pollutant source, and you'd probably analyze this 
in terms of where is the typical wind patterns. And so it may be located some distance downwind and sideways from the typical wind pattern from a known pollutant source. So we use y equals 500 meters. Here's our emission rate, the wind speed, and so on. And you can see how I've done the substitutions. Uh, the reason why I break it up like this is uh, this would be the concentration. This first factor would be the concentration at the center line of the plume. And then these two subsequent factors are sort of like reducing the concentration based on um, where you are vertically and where you are side to side. So this first one of 0.3791, that has to do with the 500 meters away from the center line. If we were right on the center line, then this factor would be equal to 1. And the same thing is true with the second term. This 94 meters is how far down we are on the ground. So the plume is above us by 94 meters. So if we were interested in finding the, con the maximum concentration, four kilometers downwind, then we'd say it's on the center line at elevation. So both of these reduction factors would be equal to one if we were finding the worst case concentration four kilometers downwind. So it turns out to be 5.66 times 10 to the minus fourth grams per cubic meter. And if we want to know micrograms per meter, then we'd multiply that by 10 to the sixth as a conversion factor. Now this this is just an analysis of what happens at uh, the wind speed that we've mentioned, 5.5 meters per second, and stability class C. If you were going to do this in the real world, you'd maybe want to analyze what would be the concentration if it was more windy versus less windy uh, under stability class A versus stability class F. You do what's called a sensitivity analysis. And in a sensitivity analysis, you play with the input variables to see what range of outputs you get. You know, what's the maximum concentration, what's the minimum concentration under a range of atmospheric conditions. Lots of wind, little wind, and so on. Any questions about the example? Okay, so this is the last part of your homework assignment that's due on Saturday, is a problem that's very similar to this. Let's talk about inversion a bit more. Before we go for today, the Gaussian dispersion model is modified if we've got an inversion. Remember that the inversion is when there is a slight increase in air temperature as we go up vertically. The normal thing is that air should be getting cooler as you go up in elevation. But in an inverted uh, conversion, it's actually getting warmer with elevation, and then that kind of traps the pollution. So what we would normally use for the Gaussian dispersion model only applies until the pollutant plume touches the inversion layer. But then the pollution can't continue to expand beyond that. And so there's sort of a dividing line at which the Gaussian model, we have to stop and put that away, and there's a a different model that's used for uh, if there is a, uh, an inversion in place where the height of the plume is equal to the height of the inversion. So when the standard deviation vertically is equal to the height of the inversion, then you switch over to a modified version. This is the modified version, which is an inver uh, of the, the Gaussian dispersion model, where it's no longer spreading out vertically but it is continuing to spread out horizontally. You'll notice there's still an S sub Y parameter here to account for it spreading out side to side within the inversion, but vertically speaking, it's evenly distributed. So you won't actually do any calculations related to inversion, but I wanted to just uh, mention to you that if there is an inversion, then it can change which model you use. All right, so today we are meeting in EB2 115 at 2 o'clock for our uh, trip to the wastewater treatment plant. I'll see you there. And remember that uh, looking into the future, there's an upload of your project tomorrow and a homework assignment on Sunday. So before you go, please put your in-class exercise on the chair. And I'll see you in EB2 115 in about an hour.